Welcome to lecture 12, in which I'm going to talk about the pendulum. And I'm going to focus on the simple pendulum, which is essentially a long string. It's hanging from a fixed point up here. The end of the string has a heavy mass. Now imagine, at least right now, that string itself doesn't have any significant mass. It's light. So all the mass is right in the center. And this is what we mean in physics by a simple pendulum. Now, the pendulum is going to be the first, our first example of a system which is not a mass on a spring. And it is our first example of a system that is going to undergo simple harmonic motion approximately. So not exactly, we're going to make an approximation um, in our analysis of this system. But that, up, up that, that approximation will be good, it will be, you know, a be almost exact provided um, the the motion of the oscillation remains small so in the case of the pendulum it means that it doesn't swing too far left and right if it swings all the way to like 90 degrees horizontal that's a big oscillation but if you imagine it just swings a little bit back and forth um, then our approximation will be will be good how little is little well well we can talk about that um, when it comes to it. So here's a picture of the pendulum and I'm going to imagine right now the pendulum has swung out to um, by some arc length s, right? It moves in a, in a circle, or a fraction of a circle, so I'm going to label s the arc length from the center to the right that marks the current location of the pendulum. This curved line um, is s. Now, what forces are acting on this? Hopefully, you um, come to this, to this conclusion that there are two of them. There is going to be the tension in the string. Let's label that T. Now, we don't want to confuse it with the period of the oscillation, um, but we won't. Right? T right now means tension. Then, of course, there's the, the weight. Um, the weight, I'm just going to write mg because that's what it is. Okay, so th those are the only two forces that are um, that are acting. So let's do what we learned in the previous lecture and let's write down Newton's second law for this and um, figure out what the equation of motion is and see if we can solve it. So we notice that the motion of the, the pendulum is constrained to go along the circle. Right? So what I know right away is that if I split this, um, this situation into an x and a y axis, and I make my, my x axis, say, be essentially tangential, and my y axis be, be radial, because this is you know, circular motion around the center point here, this is a tangent to the circle. This is in the direction of the radius of the circle. Then I can see right away that the radial component of the of those forces they must cancel out. And so here are my two components of the weight: um, one in the radial direction, one in the tangential direction. Um, it has to be so. Otherwise, the object would start accelerating in this direction or in this direction that would have to change the length of the string, and we assume that to be impossible. So the only the net force that we have is due to this component here, and is in the tangential direction. Now from the geometry of this, I think it's easy to see that this one is also beta. Right, because it's one straight line, in each case the angle with the vertical. So let's write down the um, Newton's second law. So MA, and A is in the tangential direction, is equal to MG, the opposite, sine beta. Right, because that is the 
the component of the weight, it doesn't get cancelled out by anything. This component here, that gets cancelled out by the tension. Um, but this, this ball, this mass, is right now this instant accelerating in this direction. It could be going upwards, but then slowing down. Right? It could be going downwards and speeding up. Now, because S is defined towards the right, like this is a positive number, it gets bigger as we go to the right. And that means the acceleration is in the negative direction. So you need to put a minus sign right there. Okay, now I can see that I can actually cancel out the M's. That's interesting. It tells me right away that whatever physics I'm going to discover, whatever's going to happen, it's not going to depend on the mass that is hanging from that pendulum. So what is A? The, the, um, the tangential acceleration, that is just the rate of change of the speed of the mass, which in turn is just the rate of change of S. Right? So I have to do AT equals D, right, as D speed DT. Um, the speed is DS DT. This is going to be d2s divided by dt squared. Not divided, you know what I mean. The second derivative of s. Um, now, what is s? Well, s is, of course, the arc length, yes, but it relates to beta and l. So I want to relate it to beta and l because beta changes, as does s. So my if I plug this back in here, I'd have an s and a beta. I've got two variables, but they're not independent of each other. Because we have, um, so we have this, and we have that s is equal to beta times l, assuming beta is given in radians, and that is by the definition of angle as a ratio of arc length over the radius. The radius here is just the length of the string l, right? So the angle is arc length over l. That is what we mean when we use radians, right? Angle in radians is angle as a ratio of arc length over a radius. So that implies then that AT, right, is the second derivative of, of S, but S itself is equal to this, and L doesn't change. So what I'm going to get is that AT is equal to um, let me write it out, d2 beta dt squared times l, right, because d2s dt squared, take the second derivative of this, the only variable here is the angle beta, that's the thing that's changing. So let's put those pieces together. So what am I going to get? I'm going to get the following equation. The equation I'm getting is that L times d two b beta d t squared, so that's this part here, is equal to minus g times sine of beta. That is my equation of motion. It's an equation of motion expressed for the angle as our variable. Right? That's totally fine. Now, I could have instead written this in terms of s, in which case I really all I have to do is I, I multiply this by l, and in, instead of beta here, I've got s over l inside the sine function. Okay, I could have done this. I'm going to do my analysis in terms of the angle. Right? So this is an equation that has to be obeyed by any function of time that's supposed to give me the angle. Right? So I ask you, what is the angle? at all possible times, and you give me a function, you propose a function beta of t, that makes this true. Right? Problem is, this is really hard to solve. Hard to solve. And in uh, mathematical terms, problems tend to be either trivial or hard. There's nothing in the middle. This one is hard. I don't have any, you know, I can't tell you what the answer is. What function beta of t there is such that its second derivative 
is equal to the sine of the function itself. Not sine of t, I know that, right? But sine of the function itself. Like, I don't know how to solve this. All right, so are we stuck? I, I have no idea what to propose. I can't give you, I could just make some wild guesses. We can try them out. They're probably um, going to be wrong. Right, but that is, strictly speaking, my equation of motion for the pendulum. With then the dynamics expressed in terms of the variable beta, in terms of the angle. So here's what I do. I can approximate this equation um, by something slightly different. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use what's called a small angle approximation. And you may have met this before. Just keep this in the, the screen so you can still see it. So use the small angle approximation. And the small angle approximation says, it says that the sine of theta is approximately theta, uh, the cosine of theta is approximately 1, the tan of theta is approximately also theta, so they're essentially the same, um, and all of that if theta is small, and I write much smaller than 1, then I can make those approximations. Now, if you've studied Taylor expansion, and you understand how to write any function or any you know, suitably continuous smooth function as a polynomial, um, or approximated by a, by a finite polynomial, then this would just be the first order expansion of those. If that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry. You will get to take a Taylor expansion, Taylor series course, um, hopefully sooner rather than later, because it's a very important mathematical tool to have at your disposal. But I just ask you to try that, right? And all of this is in radians, right? This is true in radians. In degrees, you just have to convert. So don't do it. You work in radians. So just try it. Now, what you should find is that even at fairly large theta, it's actually an okay approximation. Even at, let's call it sizable, it's an okay approximation. Um, let, me, let me illustrate it to you. So, let's say theta is 15 degrees, which of course is pi over, um, pi over, oh, actually, let me go with 30 degrees, make 30 degrees, make it bigger, 30 degrees, right, so that is, that is a fair chunk of degrees, right, that is a, um, a third of the way to 90, um, so that, that's pi over, pi over 6 radians, right, um, now, pi over 6 is, if you work it out as a um, decimal, it's 0 0.52 something. It's approximately that. But meanwhile, the sine of pi over 6 is approximately, um, well, it's equal to 0 0.5. So it's really fairly, fairly close. Right. And that's a pretty big angle. Now, the cosine one isn't quite as good. The tan one won't be quite as good. But but in our case, right, we have a sign to worry about. So that's the relevant part of the small angle approximation for our, for our purposes. And that, I mean, 30 degrees is substantial, right? I mean, the way I've drawn it here, that's maybe about 30 degrees, maybe slightly less, right? So that's still swinging out a fair amount. And the approximation is still fairly good. Now you should try, if you haven't done that before ever, actually just play with this, plug in some very small values, try 0.1 radians. What's sine of 0.1 radians? What's tan of 0.1 radians? What's cosine of 0.1 radians? 
What's sine of 0 0.01 radians? What's tan of 0 0.01 radians? Try it. Right? It's something you just need to get a feel for so you so you understand that this is not something that's just plucked out of thin air. Um, you know, get out a graphing function and and um, plot sine theta over theta. Let's see how close it stays to 1, the ratio, the ratio of those two. Um, graphically speaking, right, of course, how does this come about? Just, let's just focus on the sine. So if this is, this is theta, this is sine theta. Right, so the sine function, of course, looks something like this. Now let's zoom in on this segment here. Uh, I'm zooming in, so this goes something like this, right? Just this part here. And then it goes off. Uh, so I've zoomed it. It's my zoomed in view. The slope here is one. And um, that you can you can figure it out because you know how to take the derivative of sine. That's cosine. Cosine of zero is one. The slope here is one. The tangent looks something like this. This is a straight line, the same slope as the sine function at this point. Now, of course, I've just sketched it. I could have fooled you, but if you try to do this, say, on a, on a um, graphing you know, software, you're going to get something that looks like this. And you can tell that at least for a certain amount of time, for a certain amount of angles as they're getting bigger, the two of them are very, very, very similar to each other. Very similar. So only when I get to our here, I can tell, okay, they're clearly distinct functions. But as long as it's small around here, they're very similar. Again, if you don't trust me, I could draw you anything, right? No, go and plot it on something like um, desmos.com or some graphing, graphic, um, graphing software of your choosing. All right. So let's accept now that this is a good approximation, provided that the angle is small. Right, so we're going to use this approximation. So what do we get? Well, this was our function. We're just going to replace um, sine beta by beta. So I'm going to get L times d2 beta dt squared. And that is now so right, approximately equal to minus g beta um, if beta stays small right small ish right how small does it have to stay well it depends how accurate a result you care about right you can decide what is the maximum angle um, such that the error you get from by replacing from replacing beta um, replacing sine beta with beta like when the error gets too big at what at what angle does that occur it's up to you like you define your own error tolerance here um, but this is going to be my my new equation of motion. Okay, so let's look at this one. What is it saying? It's saying a constant times the second derivative of the angle with respect to time is equal to minus another constant times the angle itself. Let's compare this to the spring. So CF, compare with, conferatur, from the Latin, and to be compared with. So for the spring, we had m d2x dt squared equal to minus kx. So you can tell the similarity between those two equations, right? Because the fact that this is called L and this is called G and this is called M and this is called K, that doesn't matter. The math doesn't care what you call your constants. It's constant times second derivative of the variable is equal to minus other constant times the variable. Constant times second derivative of the variable with respect to time is equal to minus constant times the variable. So it's almost like there's this dictionary here between, between the, the quantities relevant for the pendulum and the ones for the spring itself. So so let's write this down. So I essentially have my variable is x. In the case of the spring, it's a little bit like beta. They have different meaning. x is a physical displacement in meters. 
beta is a well it's physical a physical displacement too but it's an angle right but it doesn't matter the math doesn't care what the symbols mean what the variables physically mean the math is still gonna be the same when it comes to figuring out what function of time is allowed so then I've got m sort of looks like l the way it appears in the, the equation and of course I have the k sort of seems like the g now strictly speaking um, of course you could rearrange this equation um, so really it's the ratio of those that um, k over m is sort of like g over l right because i say i could rearrange either one of those equations take one of the constants to the other side it doesn't really change the math at all um, so the correspondence is is about the fraction k over m and g over l that is is clearly the same or takes the same role in those two equations so that means all the math that we did for this equation applies just the same to this equation you've literally just changed what you what symbol you use for the variables and constants yes different physical meaning but the math doesn't care um, so we know what the answer is um, the answer is going to be that the angle as a function of time is some constant that was the amplitude let's call it the 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 maximum angle we're going to get that is how far does this thing swing out like where does it stop before it swings back right times the sine of omega t plus phi naught where omega is equal to what square root of k over m that's what it's for the spring but in our case it has to be the square root of g over l just by by analogy right so this is fixed by what planet are you on how long is your pendulum um, and the other constants are arbitrary They are fixed by what we call the boundary conditions. That means uh, someone says at time t equals zero, the mass is at um, you know at the maximum point, which is ten degrees out. Okay, that stating that is going to fix those values. Right? It's a particular situation that then fixes what values I should use for those. But the physics says for any simple pendulum the the rate of oscillation is given by this and those two can be freely um, chosen by essentially the initial setup now a word of warning just so we don't get confused omega is not not this right omega is it's not literally a, a rate of change of angle right it's the rate at which the sine function oscillates but the sine function itself tells me what an angle is right? if this is the physical angle it's moving back and forth if i actually wanted to find the rate of change of angle that is not a constant right it's slow here speeds up slows down speeds up right so this constantly keeps changing um, omega is not equal to that this is a common confusion because the variable is an angle the angle that the pendulum is at but then i describe the the time dependence of it in sort of pseudo angular um, variables omega right looks like a something going in a circle except it's it's not um, although we do understand the connection between circular motion and simple harmonic motion as the the simple harmonic motion being the shadow of circular motion the point is don't get confused if you are confused we can talk about that more in class okay so 
Here's an exercise for you. Check if, um, if you've paid attention so far. Check explicitly that this satisfies the equation of motion. Right? I've argued by this sort of analogy. I said, look, this equation looks exactly like this equation. Therefore, the solution we found for this, right, works as long as I make this translation from one symbol to the other symbol. Right? This equation, this equation. But I know because I know what function makes this one true, so I know what function makes, so I know what function makes this one true, so I can also know what function makes this one true. Looks exactly the same. If argued, hopefully convincingly, that's the claim. Why not just check? Take this function, plug it into here, take the second derivative of it, plug into here, plug into there, and see if it works out. Because it should. Okay, now just to finish this, um, this lecture, let's do one quick example calculation involving a pendulum, um, and then we'll be on our way. So here's the example I want to go through. I imagine I have a simple pendulum like the one we talked about, um, and this the string has a length of 2.5 meters, which is fairly long. Right? It's the height of a, of a ceiling in a, in a small room, um, and it swings out to 15 degrees. So that is my, my maximum angle. I don't know the mass of it. I don't have to, as it will turn out, um, and I don't know it here. I'm assuming this is on Earth. And our goal is to find the speed of the mass when it's right at the bottom. So I want to figure out when the mass is here, right, how fast is it physically going to the right? What is V? I don't want to find the rate of change of angle. I might have to find along the way. I literally want to find the speed. Okay. So the first thing I notice is that this is in degrees, so let's better convert it. 15 degrees, that is pi over 12 radians. Uh, because, you know, pi is 180 degrees, so 15 degrees is 1 12th of that, pi over 12. Okay, so what's the speed? Well, the speed, um, let me write down here, the speed is the rate of change of arc length. As this moves along, how much arc length does it, does it cover? What is it literally the distance covered per time taken? Now, s, s is equal to the length times the angle. Um, so let me call it um, s times, we called it beta before, let me just call it something else. Why not? Oh no, let me stick with beta. This is, the, this is the arc length along here. So that implies that the speed ds dt is going to be equal to L times db dt, right? Because L is a constant at 2.5 meters. That is not going to change. It would be a more complicated problem if it did. And you might do that kind of problem where that string can stretch like in a more advanced mechanics course. Um, but not here. So L times dB dt. Now what is, sorry, d beta dt. What is d beta dt? Well, we know um, what beta is. We worked it out before. Beta is some maximum angle times the sine of omega um, t should I include the, the phase constant? It doesn't really make a difference, but I'm going to include it just for completeness. Um, so we know this. Now in in our case, we know the value of beta max. So explicitly we're told it's pi over 12. Right? So I'm, I'm going to be able to, to plug that in, but first I'm going to take the time derivative. Beta dt is equal to beta max times, so it's sine goes to cosine, and the thing multiplying the variable comes out front, omega cosine 
omega t plus phi naught. Um, now I can plug in values. This is going to be um, this is going to be pi over twelve. Now what is omega? Omega, right? We know, and where I'm going to put it, I'm going to squeeze it over here. Omega is the square root of g over l. Right? And g is 10, approximately. L is 2.5. So um, omega is equal to 10 over 2.5. Those are the values they have. It's the square root of 4. 10 over 2.5. So that's 2. 2. Times cosine of omega t plus phi naught that argument is going to constantly change, right? The rate of change of angle is going to constantly change, as we said before. When it's swinging back and forth, well, when it's up here, it's change, it's swinging very slowly. Now it's speeding up, it's covering more angle per time. That was what was d beta dt is. It's covering less angle per time, faster, more angle per time, less angle per time. So this is what ca was captured in this. We care about the maximum. So let's go back to the speed. Speed is equal to L. It's 2.5. We write down L times dB, d beta dt, which is 2.5 meters times d beta dt, pi over 12, times 2. What should I put here? Well, the cosine of this, who cares what's in it, right? Because I only care about the speed at the bottom, and I know at the bottom the speed is a maximum, right? So the maximum, this is going to be um, between, this is going to be, be between, between 0, minus 1, and plus 1. It's in that, in that interval, so to get a maximum speed, I'm just going to plug in plus 1. So I'm going to get the max speed. Because at the bottom, it has to go fastest. It has, it's, it has the most kinetic energy, the least gravitational potential energy. Um, bottom, the max speed is going to be 2 times 2.5. That's 5 over 12 times pi. Um, We can, we can work out what that is. Um, 5 over 12 pi um, meters per second. I'm just going to gonna leave it like this. It's going to be something like 1.3, I think. Um, way down. But you can check that, of course, with your, with your calculator. That's the maximum speed, because we know that happens at the bottom. Now, another way you could actually work this out is by thinking about what height does the pendulum gain as it moves up, like just literally the height above the lowest point, the vertical height. And you can work with gravitational and kinetic energy, gravitational potential and kinetic energy to figure it out, what the maximum speed is. Then you get a very similar answer, maybe not exactly the same, because for our calculation, what we made the approximation that beta is always small, we made it small, angle approximation. Um, okay, so that is it. And of course, lots of other examples we could do, and you'll be um, tackling more in your homework. Um, in the next lecture video, we are going to generalize this way of thinking to other systems where there are small oscillations um, that approximate simple harmonic motion. And those small oscillations approximating simple harmonic motion is extremely common and there's a very simple mathematical reason for it and we're going to explore what that reason is. In the meantime though, if you're bored at home, you can actually maybe check that what we discovered here is actually true. Right? We're doing physics, you not just math, so you want to check does the world re really behave that way. So here's what you can do. Get a string, tie a mass on the end of the string, doesn't matter what it is. And make sure the string is fairly light and the mass is comparatively heavy. And time how long it takes for the string 
pendulum to swing back and forth. Time it so you get the period. Maybe you, you wait for it to do it 10 times, right? And that gives you um, 10 periods. So you, find, you divide by 10 to get a period. Figure out what omega is. You know how omega and the frequency f and the period are related. And then, you know, plot down your data and vary the length of your, of your string. So get a graph of omega against L and see if it matches this. Now, I'd ask you to also try it with different values of g, but it's going to be fairly difficult because I don't think you have the funds to go to the moon um, or to Mars. Um, and doing it in an accelerated reference frame, like in a, um, say, an, in an, say, an elevator that's accelerating upwards, downwards, it's not going to last very long. It's not going to give you I mean, enough time to do that experiment either. But you can test whether this relationship between this and length actually works, or you can just do it once and plug in the value and check that that, that relationship is actually true. A little experiment um, for you to do at home shouldn't take you too long. All you need is a stopwatch and a string and a little mass. Okay, so that's about a pendulum. We're going to generalize that way of thinking in the next lecture video. I'll see you there.